Now, if you've ever taken an introductory science course before, you might have seen a demonstration performed in which your teacher or the instructor put a piece of metal into water and you observe that smoke or flames or sparks were produced. And you might have noticed that when they put other metals as we move down the periodic table into the water that it got more energetic and more energetic and more energetic. And you might have even been astute enough to realize that those were the alkali metals in the first group, or the first family. And as you move down that column, you might have said, well, what if we took a piece of francium and put it into water? Imagine the explosion that we'd get there. Well, I got some news for you. You're not likely going to be able to get any francium to do that experiment to confirm your hypothesis. The problem with francium is that it's pretty unstable. In fact, at any given time, you're probably only going to find a few grams of it in the entire Earth's crust. And that's if you were able to figure out what it looked like anyway. You see, francium is unstable. It breaks down over time. And you know what? To be honest, if you found this francium, I don't really think you'd get uh, the big reaction that you were looking for. You see, this guy, he came up with this idea of relativity. Particles, when they get large enough, are relativistic. And what that means is that these electrons are moving so fast that the radius or the size of francium is actually going to be slightly smaller than the radius of the element above it on the periodic table, that is cesium. So in fact, cesium is likely to be more reactive than francium anyway. Well, to help us with this, we got to talk to our friend, Papa Periodic Table over here, Dmitry Mendeleev. He came up with this observation that elements show a periodic repeating of observable trends and characteristics, and he was able to arrange them into an early version of what we now come to know as the periodic table. But what kind of trends did he observe, and what kind of trends do we observe now? Well, let's take a look at a few. And in order to take a look at these trends, we have to understand a few factors. So to help us figure this out, let's take a look at an onion. An onion, much like ogres, thanks Shrek, has layers. And these layers are really distinct in this particular onion and so much distinct that we could assign them numbers, one all the way to seven. And if we treat the center of the onion as the nucleus and the outermost layer of this particular onion, as its valence or outer layer, we can see a similar type of thing with an atom. The onion has various rings, an atom has various energy levels. The size of the onion gets larger with the more layers that it has, the size of an atom gets larger with the number of energy levels that it has. The distance between the center of the onion and the outermost layer is its radius, just as it is with any spherical object. So let's take a look at our first trend. Here we have something that we call atomic radius. And looking back at our onion analogy, just as we had the radius of the onion being the center to the outermost, here we have, in terms of atomic radius, the distance from the nucleus to the outermost electron. And the outermost electron and the outermost layer are given a term that we refer to as valence electron and valence energy level to indicate that they are the outermost. Now, the trend that we observe in atomic radius is that atomic radius increases as we go down a group, or a column, or a family if you like, and it decreases as we move left to right across the periodic table. Well, why is this the case? Well, we have to take a look at a few things in order to figure this out. The first one, and probably the easiest one to talk about, is the number of energy levels. That is, the more energy levels that a particular atom has, the more layers it has. And the more layers it has, the further out is that outermost layer and that outermost electron. And so, its atomic radius gets larger. And these layers are added each time we move down a period into the next period and the subsequent period in a group, and so that's why we observe, or one of the reasons why we observe, that the atomic radius increases. But there are other factors as well. One of those factors is something called the shielding effect. Now we have our valence layer, outer layer, but inside there, there are these core electrons, those non-valence electrons. 
and they act as barriers between the attractive force of the nucleus, and more specifically the protons, the positively charged particles in the nucleus, and the negatively charged electrons on the outside. They actually shield that attractive force so that the electrons, as they get further and further away from the nucleus become more and more shielded and that attractive force becomes less and less, allowing these electrons to move faster and farther away from the nucleus, increasing its overall size and atomic radius. And finally, we have this idea of a repulsive force. That is, the more electrons that get added, the more negative charge there is and the more they're going to repel and the further away from the nucleus they are going to get. We should also add that as we move left to right across the periodic table, the atomic radius decreases because we are increasing the magnitude of positive and negative charge. Now you might be saying, well, we're adding a proton, but we're also adding an electron. So shouldn't the atomic radius remain the same as we move across a period? Well, you would think so. In fact, you might even say, well, we're adding additional electrons. Aren't we going to get more of a repulsive force? And there is some of that. But what happens is you can think about it as being an amount of charge. Remember, these things are going to attract. The more positive charge and the more negative charge, the stronger attraction there's going to be. Think about it as a more strong uh, positive magnet and a stronger negative magnet the more protons and electrons we have and so the attractive force becomes greater and greater and so as we move left to right across the periodic table our effective nuclear charge increases. The second trend that we're going to take a look at is that of ionic radius and just as atomic radius was the distance from the nucleus to the uttermost electron of an atom, ionic radius is the distance from the nucleus to the uttermost electron of an ion. And we have to quickly take a look at the periodic table to understand what trends are observed. And that is, remember that on the periodic table, the metals appear on the left side as we look at it, and the nonmetals appear on the right as we look at it. Metals are going to show a tendency to lose or donate electrons to become isoelectronic or have the same electron configuration as the noble gases. So they're going to form positively charged cations, as we call them. The nonmetals are going to do the opposite. They are going to show a tendency to gain electrons in order to become stable or isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas. And in gaining electrons, they become negatively charged anions, as we call them. And the trend that we observe in ionic radius is that cations have smaller atomic, sorry, smaller ionic radii than their respective atoms' atomic radius, and the anions have a larger radius than their respective atoms' radius. In the first instance, where we have, say, a metal with one valence electron in its valence shell, this metal is going to show a tendency to lose that valence electron. And in doing so, it's going to lose an entire energy level, which is obviously going to make it smaller. But in addition to that, it now has fewer electrons than it did before, and that is the positively charged protons are going to be greater in number than the electrons. And so there's a greater positive charge relative to the negative charge of the electrons, and so they are going to more closely attract each other. And what's going to happen is we're going to see a further reduction in the radius of that particular ion. Now on the flip side of this, if we take a look at a nonmetal, the nonmetal is going to have to gain one or more electrons, and in doing so, even though it doesn't gain or lose energy levels, what we do have is a difference in the number of electrons and protons. Here in these nonmetals, they now have a greater negative charge than they do a positive charge, and so because of that, the protons cannot attract the electrons as closely, and the radius of the ion increases. The third trend that we're going to take a look at is that of ionization energy. Now ionization energy is the amount of energy required to remove the most weakly held electron of a particular atom or ion. Now the further out it is from the nucleus, the easier it's going to be removed, and the closer it is to the nucleus, the harder it is or more energy that's going to be required to remove it. Now the general trend that we observe on the periodic table is that ionization energy increases up and towards the right. That is, it increases as we move closer and closer to helium. Now why is that the case? Well, if we take a look at helium, helium is a really small element. That is, it has only two electrons and two protons, and those electrons aren't shielded by anything. There's no shielding effect, there's no inner or core electrons there. So to try and remove an electron from a noble gas that's already stable and one that doesn't have any shielding and one that has electrons that are really close to the positively charged protons in the nucleus is going to require a tremendous amount of energy. 
Whereas if we take a look at the opposite end of the periodic table is something like cesium or francium. If we're taking a look at those particular atoms, their electrons are really far away and they are also going to show a tendency to lose one electron in order to become stable. So the amount of energy required to remove those electrons is really, really low. Now back to our modified question, why is cesium so reactive? Well, if we think about cesium, cesium is in the lower left-hand corner of the periodic table. It's got a lot of energy levels and its outermost or valence electron is found really far away from the positively charged nucleus and its attractive force. Now, it's going to show a tendency to lose that electron in order to become stable, so it's not going to take a lot of energy to remove it. And because it's so big, it has so many energy levels, it's got a lot of shielding, it's got a lot of electrons in the repulsive force, that means that outermost electron is going to be found really far away from the nucleus, there's going to be a very weak attractive force, and ultimately it's not going to require a lot of energy to remove that electron, making it extremely reactive. Now I'm going to leave you with one more thing. If we know that cesium or francium are the most reactive metals on the periodic table because of their sheer size, what I want you to think about is what is the most reactive nonmetal. So think about nonmetals in that they need and show a tendency to gain electrons in order to become stable. And think about the factors that would be involved with those nonmetals gaining electrons and what would make them extremely reactive. So hopefully this gave you an idea as to the trends in the periodic table and how they can relate and how they can help us explain something like reactivity. Thanks for watching.